Midsummer, the eastern shores of Lynn Tewal. I am now in Shannon. I joined a group of villagers taking their wares, mostly silks, along the southern shore of the Lynn Tewal. I did not know that the battalions cultivated silk, but apparently one of their chieftains stole some silkworms from the imperial land some years ago and managed to get them to thrive in the cool hills. My companions told me that battalions associate Shannon in their songs and legends with madness and tragedy. On the outskirts of town we saw a holy man down by the lake water, dressed in rags and covered in tattoos. The travelers said that he drinks nothing but water from the sacred lake, which allows him to speak with ancestors who have passed into the other world. Such holy men are allowed to wander freely through the land, even into the great halls of chieftains, whom they frequently berate for violating this ancient taboo or that. But although Caladog has more to rebuke about him than any high king in memory, they do not trouble him. He goes down to the water and speaks at length with them, convincing them of his great mission to reclaim Calradia for the Batanians, as though he were the second coming of King Mon himself. Istiania's agent in Shannon, Tassail, is one of the few Batanians not under Caladog's spell. She was the niece of old King Eril, who gave Caladog his daughter in marriage when the latter was just a young warrior, an orphan of no account, and for his generosity was murdered, according to Tassail, anyway. Her parents had opposed Caladog's rise and were executed, and those family members who survived were driven into exile. But the usurper, who bestows punishment and mercy according to his whim, chose to spare her. By all accounts, Caladog is a clever and calculating man. He chooses deliberately to act arbitrarily and impulsively, as though he were born to kingship and never doubts his own authority, as far as possible from the man he truly is, someone who needed to plot his every move to the top. Anyway, Tassail has been left to live by herself in one of those dark round towers, cluttered with her family's belongings. While I was there, she went frequently to the woods to hunt, but I suspect the stipend that Istiana pays her is her only source of income. I made my bed near what I thought was a refuse pile, but turned out on closer examination to be a heap of skulls. She told me proudly that this was her family's collection of trophies, collected over hundreds of years of battles and duels. Every skull had a story, she said, and she proceeded to tell me many of them, this one a cataphract, slain by an uncle at the Battle of Pendrike, this one a chieftain of the Fen Derngil, slain by a distant ancestor for his insolent tongue. She would rebel openly against Caladog, she said, except that if she lost her own life, who would take care of her skulls, and who would remember the deeds behind each one?